All right. Well, guys, uh, so good to see each and every one of you again tonight. We're going to begin with our lesson six over the intertestamental period. Just to recap over some of the things that we've talked about over the last few weeks, because um, I know it's a lot of information and I talk kind of fast anyways, and so it may be hard uh, to get everything down. But we talked about how with the close of the New Test, the close of the Old Testament, excuse me, the Persian Empire is the reigning empire in the world, and Alexander and the Greeks take over. In about 322 BC, after Alexander's death, the Greek Empire is divided up into four kingdoms. The two most important kingdoms for our purposes are the Seleucid Kingdom, which is centered in Antioch of Syria, and also the Ptolemaic Kingdom, which is centered in Alexandria, Egypt. If you look on a map, the, the place that is right in between the two capital cities of the two most powerful empires in the world is Judea and the city of Jerusalem. And for 120 years, the, the, the Jerusalem, Jerusalem and Judea are occupied and, and overseen by the Ptolemaic Empire. And then in 200 BC, it switches signs over to the Seleucid Empire. And with the overbearing persecutions of Antiochus Epiphanes, the Seleucid king, in about 175, Matthias and other Jews like him decide that now is the time for us to finally fight back. They're reading the book of Daniel. They see the prophecies that take place. And they think that now is the time for the fulfillment. They think they understand the fact that Antiochus Epiphanes is the great wicked king of the north that God is going to punish and God is going to exalt the nation of Israel. And they happen to be correct. We talked a lot about how if you look at Daniel chapter 12, it is stark how well Daniel prophesies what takes place between the Ptolemaic and Seleucid kings. Now, for those of us who believe in inspiration that Daniel was a prophet, that's not really a big deal for us. For critical scholars, it is a big deal because they say that there's no way that Daniel could have known the future with such accuracy. They don't believe in predictive prophecy or, or inspiration or, for some critical scholars, even God himself. But for us, we don't have that issue. So it is really quite interesting to see how well Daniel chapter 11 prophesies what takes place. So Matthias and his five sons kind of start the Maccabean revolt. Matthias dies in the infancy of the revolt, revolt but his son, Judah Maccabees, is the one who takes over as the leader. And over the course of about seven to eight years, Judah Maccabees is going to be an incredibly important figure in the history of the Jewish people and in the history of Israel as a nation. He's going to be able to raise an army at first with just a handful of men, and soon he's going to be leading battles with thousands of soldiers fighting against the most powerful empire on the face of the earth, and he's going to win a lot more battles than he is going to lose. Now he's helped by the fact that the Parthians in the Far East, one of the richest and most important areas of the Seleucid Empire, is also going to revolt at the same time. And so really, while most of the emphasis is going to be over in the Far East, hundreds of miles away, that's when the Jews are really going to be able to make a name for themselves and really to be able to fight against the Seleucid Empire. They're going to grow in status. They're going to win battles. There are going to be more Jews who are going to join the Maccabean Revolt. There are actually going to be a large number of Jews, thousands of Jews, who have actually come from Alexandria, Egypt. We've talked a lot about Alexandria, the fact that it was actually the the largest and probably most important city in the ancient world at this time, at least, without a doubt, the largest, most important city in the Ptolemaic kingdom. There's thousands and thousands of Jews living in that city, and some of those are not very Hellenized, and they have a, a heart for the call for a free Jewish state. And so thousands are going to leave Alexandria, Egypt, and go and fight with Judah Maccabees. But... Unfortunately, Judah Maccabees is going to be fighting against Bacchides, who's a general under the charge of the king Demetrius. And in 160 at the Battle of Elassa, Judah Maccabees is killed. And the movement for religious and political autonomy and freedom is going to take a devastating blow. I mean, think about in our own history, imagine George Washington dying in the, in the height of the Revolutionary War. I mean, what that would have done for morale, for the American Revolution and those who wanted freedom from British rule. I mean, it may have may have killed the entire movement. That's where we're at right now. That's where we left last week. The death of Judah Maccabees has everything up in air. He's been the, the leader, right? The de facto leader of the Jewish people for eight years. He's the one who's given them their victories. He is seen as a messianic figure, and he dies in battle. What on earth is going to happen now? And so that's where we left off last week. With his death, Bacchides is able to regain military control of the area, and he hunts down revolters. 
he goes on the hunt for Ju for uh, Judah's brothers, Jonathan, John, and Simon or Simeon, the living brothers. I do have one correction from last week, and that is when talking about Hanukkah and 164. Now, this is the area that Judah Maccabees and his brothers kind of have. Autonomy may be too strong of a word, but this is where they exercise the greatest amount of control. And most people within this area have been pushed out if they're apostates or if they're Gentiles. There are a few that remain, but for the most part, the Maccabean um, movement has taken root in this area. You can see this is the heart of Judea. This is Jerusalem and Jericho. And so the, this is kind of the stronghold of the Maccabean revolt. And so talking about the high priest succession, last week I talked about how when Judah Maccabees came in, and Judah's misspelled there, but um, yeah, it is. Uh, Judah Maccabees uh, takes over the Temple Mount in 164, and I said he installs his brother Jonathan on the throne as the high priest. That was wrong. Judah actually takes on the high priesthood for himself and reigns as high priest from 165 to 162. A, a terrible uh, a mistake on my part, and nobody's more disgusted by that than I am. But Alchemist is the one who uh, Bacchides and the king of the Seleucid Empire was trying to put on the throne. I say throne. Throne may be too much of a, of a misnomer, but trying to put in power as the high priest. The high priest is seen as the leader, the closest thing to a governor slash king of the Jewish people. And so they think if we can just get our, get our man in there, everything's going to be okay. Now, does this sound like modern diplomacy? Yeah, I mean, if you if you watch the news and you keep up modern diplomacy, we have coups around the nation all the time. I mean, what has been America's standing, you know, since the 1940s? Well, if we want lasting change in a certain country, all we got to do is just oppose whoever's in charge, put in a pro-American guy, and then he's going to usher in democracy and they're going to be great friends with the U.S. How's that worked? Uh, like 90% of the time, it works out pretty bad. I mean, going anywhere from, from South Korea to South Vietnam, even to modern-day Afghanistan and Iraq, you know, just doesn't work well most of the time. Well, it's not a new thing. It's been the thing for all of history. And so they think, well, if we can just get the high priest in there who's pro-Greek, pro pro-gymnasium, pro-symposium, who's pro-Hellenization, eventually he can have enough clout and push with our military. We'll just make everybody else see the light of day and change cultures, and everything's going to be okay. Didn't work in the Middle East back then. Doesn't work today. But now I'm got to meddling. Anyways, so Alchemist becomes the high priest with the military backing of Bacchides and the Greek army. And he's hated. He's hated because he's pro-Greek. He's anti-Judaism. And he's actually, in 162, tries to tear down the dividing wall between the Israelites and the Jews, I mean, sorry, the, the Jews and the Gentiles on the Temple Mount. Now, if you can remember in your mind's eye, and this is my fault, I should have had a picture on there. But if you remember the temple, right, there are two main courtyards of the temple, right? You have the temple proper, and in that temple you have a large courtyard, and it's called the courtyard of the Jews. It's kind of a misnomer because are all Jews allowed in that courtyard? No, just Jewish men. And then you have a big dividing wall, right? And outside there, you have a smaller courtyard. It's called the Courtyard of the... It's got two names. You can choose one or the other. The Courtyard of the Gentiles or Courtyard of the Women, right? Because if you're a Jewish woman, that's as close as you're getting to the temple. You don't get to come inside the inner courtyard. And also, if you're a Gentile, that's where you got to stop. Well, what do you think Alchemist decides? Why would he want to tear down the dividing wall between the Jews and the Gentiles in the courtyards? Think about it. He's a pro-Hellenistic high priest. He's trying to say, look, we should accept the Gentiles. We're no different than the Gentiles. We should let them serve Yahweh. And if you want to make a sacrifice to Zeus, we got to get along to get along, right? So it doesn't really matter. So while he's trying to tear down the wall, he's stricken with the illness and dies. Now, if you're a loyalist Jewish fighter who's pro-Maccabean revolt, what are you going to say when he gets sick and dies? God killed him, right? Did he? I mean, did God sanction there to be a dividing wall between the Jews and Gentiles in the tabernacle and on the Temple Mount? Yes. 
So is he literally doing something that transgresses God's law as high priest? Yes. It's ironic he dies during the exact same time he's trying to get this accomplished. So, you know, yeah, it may it could have been. Anyways, the high priesthood is vacant from 159 to 153 where there's intense fighting between the Israelites and the Jews. And then Jonathan um, Aphus, who is the younger brother of Judah Maccabees, then he will assume the high priesthood in 153 to 143. But I wanted to, to clear that up from last week. This is a picture of Jonathan. Jonathan is going to be the main focus of our study tonight because he's such an important figure in the history at this time point. Really, if you look at last week, we looked at really 170 to 160. That was the 10 years where Judah Maccabees was the central figure of the Maccabean Revolt. Tonight, we're going to look at 160 to 143. Those are going to be the years, the 17 years, that Jonathan is going to be the central figure of the Maccabean Revolt. Now, you got to give Jonathan some credit before this also. He's been fighting during the entire revolt. He's been a leader of men. He's been a very important as, uh, person in uh, the leadership of the Maccabean Revolt while his brother Judah was alive. But now that Judah has died, he has assumed the lead role in the, uh, the Maccabean Revolt, which is interesting because there are three brothers who are still alive. Jonathan is actually the youngest brother. Not very common in the ancient world for the youngest brother to take over as the leader. But Jonathan is smart, he's charismatic, he's brave, and he really is kind of the only choice at the time. I mean, Judah dies, and there's no bickering among the followers as to who's going to pick up the mantle. Everybody just kind of turns to Jonathan as like, you're a baby now, right? We'll follow you if you want to fight. And that's what happens. And so um, Jonathan takes the lead, like I said, in 160 B.C. with the death of Judah Maccabees, the Battle of Elassa. And he's the new leader of the Maccabean Revolt. Jonathan will be recognized as an excellent diplomat and politician, always knowing what horse to back and when was the right moment to shift sides, and he shifts sides in every major conflict they're going to fight. Jonathan is also an important figure because he is the ancestor of Josephus, the great historian and writer. Josephus was a general during the Jewish war in 66-70. Uh, Jo Josephus is from an aristocratic family in the Hasmonean dynasty, and it's because he is a direct descendant of Jonathan Apphus. And so while they're on the run, they're hunted by Bacchides, right? So Bacchides is the general who's defeated Judah Maccabees and killed him, and now he's on the lookout for any of those supporters of Judah Maccabees, especially his brothers. And so his brothers decide they've got to flee. Now, if you go back to this map, I don't know if you can see this or not, but if in the bottom left-hand corner, corner, you're going to see um, Nabatea. Can you see that? If you can't, I emailed the slides to you all earlier just so you could be able to see that. But as they're fleeing across the Jordan from Jericho to Nabatea to find shelter, they're actually attacked by a clan from Madiba. And while they're attacked from a tribe from Madiba, John... One of the brothers is actually going to be ambushed and he's going to be killed. And so they're going to steal their uh, steal the baggage. They're going to kill John. Uh, to make a long story short, Jonathan and Simon are going to restructure uh, the troops. They're going to actually ambush that clan during a wedding feast, kill all of them and actually get the baggage back. They're going to go back across the Jordan River and they're going to find the army of Bacchides who's hunting them. And they're going to strike quickly. And they're going to kill about a thousand of back of these soldiers and then quickly in guerrilla warfare go across to Jordan for safety. And so they're going to evade back of these for quite some time. And back of these is going to get tired. He's going to get annoyed. And then Alchemist dies. And Alchemist dies. And then he's stricken with illness as he's trying to tear down the wall of the temple. We've already talked about that some. And so at the death of Alchemist, Bacchides actually goes back to Antioch. Now, why would he go back to Antioch after the death of the Jewish high priest? How are those two things connected? The capital of the Seleucids, right? Is he wanting to speak with one of the higher ups there? Yeah, Antioch is the capital of the Seleucid Empire. And then... You have the high priest. Really, really, Bacchides is, is sent to Judea for two reasons, right? To quash the Maccabean revolt and to make sure that Alchemist is the high priest, right? Because if, if, if Alchemist doesn't have an army backing him, I mean, the Jews would have killed him in Jerusalem the day he set foot in there. 
right? I mean, he's he's not the guy. You know what I'm saying? I mean, when we put a leader over in Afghanistan or Iraq who's not popular but he's pro-American, do we just put him there and say he's the guy now and leaves? All right, John, you're in the military. You tell me. Nobody else wants to talk. No. <laughs> no. What do you do? You hang out for another 20 years and just see how it goes. Exactly, right? <laughs> you send thousands of troops, you build forts, and you say he's our guy. And if you want to get to him, you got to go through the mind of the U.S. military, right? If you want to try it. That's exactly what Bacchides is. He is the protector of alchemists, right? But alchemists isn't killed by an army. He's killed by God if you're a faithful Maccabean revolutionary. So his mission's over, right? I mean, he doesn't, his mission to make sure there's a pro high priest, a pro Hellenistic high priest there is over. So he's got to go back to Antioch, try to figure out what are we going to do, right? What's our next move? He's got to talk to the King Demetrius. They've got to figure out, you know, we're going to try to find another high priest to install. What's, what are we going to do? And so he goes back and for two years, the Greeks are trying to figure out what they're going to do in this backwater that keeps rebelling against them. While at the same time, they're still trying to fight wars and uprisings over in Parthia and over in the northern part of the empire. And so for two years, Jonathan regains control and he starts imposing Judaism on the population. Remember, this is a time of, of civil war and inner strife. I mean, it's, it's brutal stuff, right? When, when Bacchides and the Greeks are in power, they start forcing Hellenization and killing people who don't conform. When Jonathan gets back into power, it's the exact opposite. He starts forcing Judaism, and he starts killing people who are not going to conform to Judaism. Imagine living in Jerusalem during this time. I mean, one week, if you're not pro-Hellenistic, you're getting killed, and the next week, if you're not pro-Judaism, you're getting killed, right? And so it's a very bitter time with lots of infighting, and it's just really a, a terrible time to live in this region if you're just not a hardcore zealot for one side or the other. So after two years of Jonathan imposing his will and terrorizing the Hellenistic and apostate group, Bacchides is finally sent back in uh, to quash the rebellion once and for all. But he's unsuccessful, and after humiliating defeat, Bacchides goes back to govern his own home province, and he's not going to be an issue with the Jews any longer. So the Jews have peace, and Jonathan assumes leadership of the Jewish nation, and he begins once again to purge Gentiles and apostates from the land. But not only is this a time of strife among the Jews among themselves, the Greeks are, are going to fight for the next probably 100 years over who's going to be the leader of the Seleucid Empire. Because when you have an empire that is extremely large, extremely wealthy, extremely vast, a rich heritage, and things don't go right, most people think what? If we just change the guy in charge, everything's going to be better, right? And so things aren't going very good. They're not winning battles against the Jews. They're not winning battles against the Parthians. The kingdoms in the north are becoming more and more autonomous with each passing year. And so we need a new guy. And so you're going to see time and time again, different generals or in this case, different people who set up and say, well, I'm actually the son of so-and-so. So actually the throne is my birthright. And they're going to get some generals to join their side. There's going to be civil war and conflict. And that's exactly what happens with Alexander Balas. He's the son of Antiochus Epiphanes. Who's Antiochus Epiphanes? That's right. So Antiochus Epiphanes is a direct descendant. He is the great, great grandson of Seleucus, right? The guy who the entire empire is named after. Direct descendant, right? Antiochus Epiphanes is humiliated. Um, he is killed. And then his son comes to power for a little while. And then he's deposed. Then Demetrius becomes the king, right? He's not a direct descendant of Seleucus, right? That still means something at this time to be a direct descendant of the guy. And so this guy, Alexander, comes out from nowhere and says, I'm actually the son of Antiochus Epiphanes. That's my birthright. And he's going to have the backing of the Ptolemaic kingdom, who were rivals with the Seleucid Empire, right? Now, the Ptolemies are thinking, if we can get this puppet king on the throne, that's going to help our standing in this battle between who's going to be the more dominant kingdom, the Ptolemies or the Seleucids. And so the Seleucids and Ptolemies are at war, so to speak, with Alexander, 
deposing Demetrius I. Now, Jonathan has become quite powerful and has a pretty large army. Now, what is right in the middle of Alexandria, Egypt, and, and Antioch, the two main capitals of the two empires? Jerusalem. If you're the Ptolemaics and you want to fight against the Seleucids, the landing base, right, to start the invasion is Judea. If you're the Seleucids and you want to fight against the Ptolemies, Judea is the landing area. So what are you going to do if you've got a warlord who's right there with a pretty large army and they've been fighting wars for the last 20 years and been pretty successful? You want them on your side, right? On your team. Because that's an army that can fight for you. They know the terrain. They're, they're ferocious. And so Demetrius, who's the king of the Seleucids, sends a letter to Jonathan and says, oh, hey, Jonathan, I know we've had our past. I know I've been sending generals the last seven years to eradicate you, and we murdered your brother, and things haven't been all that great. But that was the past, you know, and who, who needs all this eye for an eye stuff, right? If you will acknowledge me as the rightful king of the Seleucids, I will give you uh, status and money and power. I, I will recognize you as the provincial leader of that territory. So number one, I'm going to stop sending high priests with, with armies for their backing. Number two, I'm going to formally recognize you as the legal ruler of the area, and you don't have to fight me anymore. Not a bad deal, is it? So what does Jonathan say? Okay. I'm going to need some assurances, though. I'm going to need you to withdraw your army from the region. Don't worry. We got this handled. When, when Alexander comes in, we'll fight for you. There's no reason for you. Go back to, to go send your troops back home. You guys get rested up and get ready to fight. I tell you what, that citadel that's in Jerusalem that we've never been able to take because it's fortified up to the knees and it's got uh, our sons and our grandsons and hostages in the tower, we're going to need you to open the gates, let us in, give us our hostages. And then we'll have a deal. What does Demetrius say? Man's not in a position to barter, right? He says, okay. So he does everything that Jonathan wants. So he gives him the citadel. He gives them back the hostages. And then Alexander sends a message to Jonathan. and says, Jonathan, I've been following you guys for years. And honestly, what you guys have been able to do there against Demetrius, who's an evil person. I heard he killed your brother. Did, did that happen? Oh, okay. Just, I just want to make sure. That's what I heard. Just want to make sure. But he killed him, right? Okay. Just, and so, uh, you know, he's a terrible guy. And uh, I, I'm really impressed with you guys. And if you'll just throw your backing over to my side, I've sent you this nice purple robe and this beautiful golden crown. And I will formally recognize you as the high priest of the Jews. Think about that. Not a bad gig. So Jonathan thinks about the offer and he says, okay, we'll go with Alexander. And so he takes all the goodies from Demetrius and he turns and shifts and takes it from Alexander and then throws his backing under Alexander. And so Alexander is going to be victorious. And so he's recognized as the king after, the, after defeating Demetrius in 150. And he is now recognized as the king of the Seleucid Empire. And he's awarded the coveted marriage to Cleopatra Theo, the daughter of the Ptolemaic king. And as they have this, this enormous wedding feast between these the two most powerful families probably in this part of the world at this time, between Alexander the Seleucid king and Cleopatra Theo, who's the daughter of the Ptolemaic king, this huge wedding banquet with you know month and a half long ceremonies. And guess who is the guest of honor, or at least one of the guests of honor? Jonathan, right? Because let's be honest, he was a major key in the victory of Alexander. So Jonathan is brought in and he goes from being a renegade hiding out in the backwoods in the marshes of Judea to now being the guest of honor at the biggest wedding the world had seen in a long time, right? They give him gold and they call him up before everybody and they give him three things. They name him in this beautiful procession as the high priest, the strategos, and the, Merid the, the Meridarch, which recognizes him as the most powerful religious figure in Judea. He's the most powerful military figure in Judea. He's also the most powerful political ruler 
and Judea. Now, what are the three seats of power in any government, at least in the ancient world? Religion, military, politics. It's rare you got all three with one guy, and guess who's got it? Jonathan. I mean, it looks like that. I mean, they've been fighting for 20 years. I mean, he was just a real, real young boy when his dad and his brothers and he started fighting. And 20 years later, his dad is dead, and three of the five boys are dead. He's just got one brother left. And now he sits there as the high priest, the strategos, which is actually still what the Greek army refers to as their general, and the the political you know uh, leader of the, of, the, of the country. I mean, it's it's beautiful. I mean, he he has undeniable power in the region. And so it's a, a momentous um, occasion. He has more power than anybody has ever had before uh, during this time frame. And this really begins the start of the Hasmonean dynasty that's going to rule this area for 120 years. I mean, this is the beginning. And so, uh, so it's a really important transition. Yes, John. No. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, we never really get somebody who's kind of seen as the military commander outside of like Joshua, you know, by God, unless you're talking about like the judges. And even then, the judges never lead the entire nation. They only lead tribes and sometimes like portions of tribes. Every once in a while, maybe more than one tribe, but the judges never lead the entire nation of Israel. Um only one Samuel, the only one that would be in this in the Bible would be Samuel. Samuel would be the only one that, of the judges that would be kind of in this role before Saul became king. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, like you said, Samuel, but even he, you know, even he is, you know, arguably not as powerful as Jonathan at this point. Yeah. And so, uh, so good point, though. It's probably That probably is the closest one, right? Um but it's just a, it's a huge momentous change, right? So you have this oppressed group. They haven't had recognized official authority like this since 586 when the Babylonians came in and destroyed the temple and hazed Jerusalem. I mean, this this is the most power any Jew has had in 450 years, right? That's like twice as old as the United States. Like that, that that's a big deal. And so um, huge shift right here in uh, in Jewish history. Any other questions or comments? How long does it last, you ask? Not long. And so here's a coinage actually commemorating the marriage between Alexander and Cleopatra. And so after a few short years on the throne, Alexander, the rebellion of Demetrius II starts. And so Demetrius II, who's the son of Demetrius I, says that was an illegal coup. You're not the son of Antiochus Epiphanes. We all know you're not the son of Antiochus Epiphanes. You're just an imposter who's a Ptolemaic puppet, and I'm taking the throne back. And so he fights against him. And um, during this time frame, who is Jonathan supposed to be loyal to? Alexander, right? I mean, Alexander has been true to his word. He's given him all these things. He's made him the most powerful man in the region by far, bar none. So when the war starts, Jonathan fights for Alexander, and he has a massive victory over Apollonius, who is a Greek general fighting for Demetrius. And he has an, a, a huge, huge, smashing victory over Apollonius. He kills the vast majority of the army. He then ransacks the uh, Canaanite coastland. He destroys pagan temples in Ashdod and Azutus, those five uh, those five Canaanite cities that go all the way back to the time of like David, you know, those five uh, Canaanite kings. And so they they smash the territory. They start ransacking the area. They start getting more power and uh, more influence in the area. And Demetrius says, look, you guys are the real deal. If you'll switch sides to me, I'll recognize all these new lands you're holding as your territory. And so what does Jonathan do? Obviously, what any respectable person does in the ancient world, he says, no, no, I've given my word. Uh, sir, do you not know I'm the high priest of Israel? I've given my word to Alexander, and my word is my bond. 
No. <laughs> he says, what you got? Okay. All right. Can I get this plate? Can I get, okay. Can I get this too? Are you sure? Put it in writing. All right. You're good. All right. I'm now team Demetrius, right? That's why he's known as Jonathan the politician. He always backs the right horse and he always switches in the middle of the war to the winning side, right? It's a gift he has. Um, and so he, he switches sides for more territorial gains. And so eventually Demetrius II wins out and overtakes the throne and Jonathan makes an allegiance with Demetrius for his new loyalty and is granted with even more territorial gains. How long does it last, you ask? Not very long. <laughs> and so then you have the rebellion of Diodotus Tryphon. And these things happen. I mean, like Alexander is reigning for like two years before the rebellion starts. He reigns for like five years total. Demetrius II reigns for like five years total. And so anyways, so... Diodotus Tryphon is a Greek general, and the son of Alexander Ballas is three years old, right? Now, Demetrius II is trying to consolidate power, so he's trying to seek out this three-year-old son to kill him so he has no rivals to the throne. Well, Diodotus knows that three-year-old boy can't rule, but if I take that boy and raise an army and depose Demetrius, I can be the regent, a.k.a the real ruler of the Seleucid Empire. And that's what he does. And so um, Jonathan initially fought for Demetrius II upholding his pledge of the allegiance, but eventually switched sides to Tryphon when it was clear that Demetrius II would not be able to hold on to the throne. And so once again, Jonathan starts fighting for Demetrius II and then switches sides right at the right time and then fights for Tryphon, and eventually Demetrius II is, um, is deposed. And he gets new territorial gains, and he divides those new territorial grains with his brother Simeon. And so once again, for switching sides and backing the right horse, he's giving more power, more influence, and uh, more um, you know, larger territory, um, uh, starting to get a larger army. I mean, the Maccabeans used to fight with 300 now they fight with 50,000 men, which is a, a very large army in the ancient world, especially in this region at this time. Any questions or comments so far? It's confusing, right? All the names and switching back and forth, but um, loyalty is not very common in the ancient world. And so Jonathan's increasing power. Jonathan made his brother Simeon strategos of the coastline, and the two brothers worked together to consolidate power. And so they really focus now on really strengthening the, the hold they have on this region. They take over fortified cities. They expel Greek garrisons. They increase the size of the army. They start formulating alliances with up-and-coming nations, including Rome. And so they're really interested in this new power in the West called Rome because the Greeks seem to be getting more and more afraid of them. And the Israelites don't know a whole lot about the Romans, but they just realize that the Greeks don't like them. And a friend of my enemy is my friend. And so they start sending emissaries over to Rome and eventually are going to be recognized by the Roman Senate as a, as a kingdom. But anyways, uh, they make treaties with Rome and Sparta and a few other nations. And so they start getting more and more powerful. Now, this area that you can see here, the green part was the part that Judah Maccabees took over. This is the part that, um, that uh, Jonathan inherited. But really, that's kind of a misnomer because after Judah Maccabees is defeated in 160, that green area is retaken over by Maccabees and the Maccabeans go on the run. And so it, it looks unimpressive, the territorial gainings that Jonathan makes. But that's but if you see it that way, you're looking at the picture all wrong because he's got to retake that green area. And then he expounds upon that in those purple areas. And so not only does he... Not only does he take control, but he takes lasting control. The, the Israelites are not going to lose this territory for a very long time. And so he takes over this, this area, but he also consolidates the power and makes it a foothold and a stronghold they're not going to lose. Um, and then you have Jonathan's betrayal. And so Tryphon, who's now the regent of the Greek Empire, right? He decides that he wants a throne for himself, and he marches into Judea with an army. And Jonathan goes out and meets him with a force of 40,000 men, actually outnumbering Tryphon. Tryphon sends a messenger to Jonathan and his army, right? 
and says, no, 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 no. You've got this all wrong, man. You've got this all wrong. Remember, you fought for me. You gave your allegiance to me. I wouldn't be where I am today, Jonathan, if it wasn't for you. And I haven't forgot that. Right? I mean, I'm, I have not forgot what you've done for me. And so I want to reward you with some more territory. That coastal city, Ptolemais, and a few of those areas along the coastline that you guys already ransacked with the Canaanites. You guys don't even like the Philistines, do you? The Canaanites? I don't either. And so I'm thinking if you would like that territory for yourself and those seaports, you know, it's a huge market. I mean, it's, it's, it's very lucrative to own those seaports. Tell you what, why don't you just tell your 40,000-man army to go home? If it makes you feel safer, come back with me to Ptolemais. We'll kick it. We'll have a good time. Well, relax. Come see the new city that I'm going to gift you. It's tropical. It has palm trees. Have you ever been to Ptolemais? It's beautiful this time of year. Um, just come on. And so Jonathan being the smart diplomat who's never made a wrong move his entire life, what do you think he does? He totally goes, right? He totally sends his 40,000-man army home. He leaves 2,000 men in Galilee. Don't know why. He takes a thousand men to the city of Ptolemais, where you know he feels like he's going to be protected. But as soon as he gets inside the gate, they shut the gate and they kill the thousand man bodyguard outside the city. And Jonathan is taken hostage. And so the, the smart diplomat who's never made a wrong move made a just a terrible, terrible error. And so um, Jonathan goes to the conference, and then you have Jonathan's death. And so Typhon seizes Jonathan and kills his thousand-man bodyguard. Typhon asks Simeon, the brother, who is now kind of the de facto leader, for a heavy ransom. He makes this qualm about how the reason he did this is because Jonathan hadn't been paying the taxes. And everybody knew that wasn't true, and Simon knew that wasn't true, but he's in a rock and a hard place. So uh, Typhon asks for a large amount of money. He gives it. He also gives Jonathan's two sons. He says, look, you know, I'm, I'm a man of my word. If you just give me this large sum of money and give me Jonathan's two sons, then I'll let Jonathan go and I'll keep the sons as a hostage. So Simeon gives him the large amount of money, gives him the two sons of Jonathan, and Trifon does what? Kills Jonathan and his two sons, right? And so um, he continues in the area for quite some time. Simon and the rest of the Jews are enraged at this treachery. Even in the ancient world where loyalty and words don't mean much, this is this is a faux pas. You just don't do stuff like that. And so the Jews are enraged, and they kind of fight um, Trifon everywhere he goes, and he eventually just gives up. And Simon is going to emerge as the new leader of the Jewish people. We're going to talk a lot, a little bit, about Simon and the continuation of the Hasmonean dynasty. But Jonathan's life is such an important part. He really is kind of the linchpin of what takes place during the intertestamental period because it begins as a ragtag revolt by one family that's unimpressive that nobody really knows in the nation and it ends up with a dynasty that's going to rule for over 100 years and jonathan really is that linchpin that connects the two and so did he make a boneheaded move um by going to the conference yeah he did but he had been to conferences before, right? And everything had turned out okay. And so he was a military fighter from 167 to 160. Obviously, he fought the entire time of his life. But but he was a military fighter there for 24 years, um, from 167 to 143. He was the military leader. He was the guy, uh, the leader from 160 to 143. He was the high priest from 153 to 143. And so for, you know, really for 17 years, he is the leader of the Jewish people, religiously, politically, militarily. We don't have anybody like that in the history of this country um, that fulfilled all three roles like that, nor will we ever, just because the way we're designed. Um, but to think about one man who's got that much power, who in his personage in, in, embodies everything that, um, the nation kind of stands for. Um, Judah Maccabee's death was a huge blow. Jonathan's death is even a bigger blow uh, because of uh, his leadership. But what he is able to do during his reign is to consolidate power and take the freedom movement farther than it had ever been before. 
and really take it to a, a, a lasting level where they're going to be able to have a part on the world stage uh, for quite some time. Any questions or comments about our class tonight? Like Isaac, will there be as many names and dates next week as there was this week? Maybe. <laughs> there might be. I don't know. There is a test. The elders did give me permission to have a test, right? Multiple choice. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> Some of you probably feel like you are in a, that type of class, and for that, I'm sorry. But um, but I hope it is interesting to you. And so he takes the rebellion and lays the foundation over the nearly 20 years to make it into a dynasty. Now, the Hasmonean dynasty that would rule for nearly nearly autonomously for 100 years. This is going to be very important as we start talking about Herod the Great and start talking about the Herodians. The Herodians are not from the Hasmoneans. The Herodians are actually the family that actually deposes the Hasmonean dynasty. And we'll talk about that probably in a few weeks. Um, but 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 pretty important for us to understanding um, the New Testament world and, and the Herodian dynasty that is there in the time of Jesus and the early church. And so our conclusion... Four out of five sons of Matthias are now dead, with the only survivor being Simeon. But through the military and political courage and victories of Judas and Jonathan, the Jews of Judea are starting to become a semi-independent nation, and the dream of self-governance is becoming more and more powerful. The semi-independent area and influence are growing, and this fantasy that never could have came true is looking more and more like a reality, despite the incredible odds. And so what they did was truly set out to do the unthinkable and the impossible, right? And um, after about 27 years, it's looking like we might actually pull this thing off. Maybe God is on our side, and maybe he was. And so if you look at Daniel chapter 11, it seems like that may have indeed been the case. And so uh, there's no comments or questions. We'll go ahead and we'll close in a prayer. Thank you guys so much for your patience and uh, for your participation and attendance. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for all the many blessings that we have. We're so thankful to live in a time and age where much of the persecutions and much of the atrocities and terrible things that people have suffered while trying to follow your word uh, have not been laid upon us. And Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that we will not become weak or soft in the absence of those types of things, uh, but that we will recognize that we truly are a blessed people who truly live in a free society, and that if people in the history of your people have been able to uh, take up the sword and fight for you, uh, please help us to do the same today, but to take up the sword of the Spirit and fight for the souls of man who are dying around us each and every day. Help us to give. Help us to be courageous soldiers. Uh, and the spiritual warfare that's taking place all around us, and to seek out those that we love and care about and show them the way that you've given to us that we can have everlasting life through Christ Jesus, the true Messiah. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.